hello and welcome to the extended video recording of the very first episode of our new podcast, Mind the Gulf, uh, which is a limited podcast series from the Royal United Services Institute. Um, the first episode of the podcast was actually released a bit earlier, so if you'd like to listen to the episode just in audio, um, you can find that just by searching on the RUSI webpage for Mind the Gulf uh, or on most podcast streaming services. My name is Daria Dolzakova, and I'm a research fellow with RUSI's Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Team. And I'm Tobias Bork, and I'm the research fellow for Middle East Security Studies here at RUSI. This podcast is part of a wider project here at RUSI uh, that we've called Iran in the Global Security Context. And the aim of both the project uh, and of this podcast is to get a better understanding of how regional security issues in the Gulf and in the wider Middle East uh, region interact with the Iran nuclear issue. So namely how developments in the Iranian nuclear program and related diplomacy interact with regional security developments. And throughout the series, we'll be talking to uh, subject matter experts from across the Middle East and beyond to get their perspectives on how these two topics fit together. So we want to find out if the Iran nuclear program and the diplomacy around it are driving regional security trends or if they're impacted by regional security trends or if they're indeed separate from regional security developments and about something completely different like Iran's relationship with the US, for example, or with the wider international community, or indeed if it's something in the middle. Uh, so that's the aim of this series, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from our wonderful guests throughout. So today uh, we figured that we would start the series off by looking at uh, the country that's really at the center of all of this discussion, uh, Iran. We can't really talk about uh, the Iranian nuclear issue or regional security without understanding Iranian perspectives, concerns, approaches to the subject. Um, I mean, I guess we could, but we'd rather not. Uh, we want to make sure that we capture the Iranian perspective as accurately as we can in this discussion. Uh, so we are joined today by an outstanding expert on Iranian domestic and foreign policy, including on issues surrounding the nuclear program, Professor Nasser Hadian. Professor Hadian is uh, a professor of political sciences at the University of Tehran, where he was previously director of graduate studies from 1996 to 1998. Professor Hadian has also served as the director of the political development program at the Center for Strategic Research, which is a think tank that's based in Tehran. Uh, from 2001 to 2004, Professor Hadian was also a visiting professor and research scholar at the Middle East Institute and the Department of Middle East and Asian Languages and Cultures at Columbia University. And he really is one of the utmost experts on the subject. So we're very honored and very, very lucky to have him joining us today for this first episode. So welcome, Professor Hadian. It really is a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you very much for uh, your introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you as always and look forward very uh, look forward for a very lively I don't want to say debate but a question and answer or comment uh, program. We can get into a bit of a debate if we feel like it. <laughs> we'll exactly. see we'll see where it takes us. I love to be challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We will do our best and professor I wonder whether we could start very broad and sort of start with your view or your assessment of how Iran sees the region that it is in. If you could outline for us how Iran sees regional security in the Gulf and in the wider Middle East, uh, and how it sees its position in the region, how it sees security concerns in the region, uh, sort of a broad overview would be a great way to start. Okay, thanks a lot. Tobias, uh, I would like to begin with a, a, a little bit of conceptual uh, problem which we are facing with the whole idea of the region. What do we mean by region? What do we mean by Middle East? Okay, for a long time, for about uh, for about a century or more, you know that concept was a useful concept. That was a useful construct, uh, but it was made basically and mainly uh, Western driven concept. It is like sitting in London or Paris 
looking toward your east, toward the world. Those who are closer to you are called Near East, further away, Middle East, farther away, Far East. So it's a very much a, a view from the West to East. But that's OK. Uh, that, was, that was not all that the problem. But now, you know, for a concept to be useful, it should carry with itself three important characteristics, at least. One is denoting to a geographical area, which is the most physical part of this concept. But even when we look at the Middle East now, you're talking about sometimes about the greater Middle East, new Middle East, and then there are hundreds of conferences about what that means. Sometimes Pakistan, Afghanistan are a part of this Middle East. Sometimes Turkey is outside of this Middle East. Sometimes you bring Egypt and Tunisia, so forth and so on in this concept. Uh, so in fact, even geographically, we see expansion and contraction of the concept. So it no longer serves the purpose it used to serve to refer to a particular geographical area. Number two is that uh, concept uh, basically uh, was, or like was expected to create a sort of identity, like you have a European identity, the European, you say it. But we never call ourselves the Middle Easterners. We don't have that the. So that concept uh, also has a problem in terms of uh, identity. It never created an identity called Middle Eastern identities. We are, for instance, Pan-Iranist, we have Pan-Arabist, we have Islamist, uh, so pan turkish so forth and so on. We have all those extra na nation state uh, concepts, but not the Middle East. But most importantly is the concept that the, uh, is the, is the idea of policy. Do we have a Middle Eastern policy for any country, including US, Europe, Iran, whatever? We say Middle Eastern policies, but then we concentrate on it. We see that we don't have any Middle Eastern policies anyway. When you were talking about the basically Middle East, or Middle Eastern policy, US Middle Eastern policy, so many books written or so many conferences held. But we see that it is basically, for instance, safe passage of oil from the Persian Gulf. Just look at this Arab Spring. Let's 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 be more concrete. You see, US action in Egypt was different from Bahrain, was different from Tunisia, was different in each country US acted differently. It has a different policy. Same as Iran. We treated Egypt, Tunisia, whatever, Syria, very differently. Bahrain, very differently. So still the policies are mostly suited toward nation state rather than uh, a region, a whole region. So that's why I said no longer that's a useful concept. You have to come up with the alternative. By borrowing from Barry Bozen, uh, of security complexes, I feel they are, it's more useful concept. Of course, I would add, I have add some other things to it too, particularly in the economic and market part. So geography, security, and economy. Then we can come up with the new categories, which would help us better to come up with prescription, with recommendation what to do about security or other issues. Let's put that aside for the moment. That was a conceptual discussion. Uh, but going back to the idea of uh, how in Iran we look at the region. Let's assume vaguely we understand what the Middle East is. So how, how, how in Tehran we look at the situation? We feel when we look at from ourselves and when we rank our threat perceptions, so threat number one would be US, number two would be Israel, number three would be chaos in the region, including terrorism, number four is 
world order, which we think is in, we are in a disadvantageous position regarding the world order. And a very distant fifth recently is Saudi Arabia. So that's the way we look at it. On the basis of this threat perception, we have defined our strategic depth, which is Lebanon and Syria, in order to create an effective deterrence belt to defend ourselves. We know that that would be extremely difficult to deter Americans, and it's far easier to deter Israelis and as a consequence, also deterring Israeli, uh, Americans. On the basis of that threat perception, we have tried to build that effective deterrence. So that's why we are in Lebanon. That's why we are in Syria. It is not based on, on ideological uh, planning. It is very much based on geopolitical realities. That if we I, are building this effective uh, infrastructure, basically, uh, in, in, for deterring the Israelis. Yes, go ahead, Tobias. If I may just interject then, and just wonder how does what you're describing is when you talk about this concept of strategic depth and about figuring out a way for Iran to defend itself uh, by uh, projecting influence uh, and not just influence, but a physical presence into countries like. Syria and Lebanon. Um, does that come from a position of feeling under pressure? Or indeed, I mean, when you speak to um, analysts from elsewhere in the region, they often describe Iran actually as being in a position of strength, of being, um, you know, one of the most powerful countries in the region. So how do you, how would you describe how Iran feels about itself within uh, the Arab world and about its relationships with um, the Gulf states, but more widely with the Arab world? Yes, as I mentioned, uh, when we rank our threat perceptions, Saudi Arabia, only Saudi Arabia from among the Arab countries, only Saudi Arabia is there, and that's a very distant, distant fifth threat. Okay, so we don't, con we don't perceive them, we don't consider them as a threat. Although, if you go to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, we are number one threat for them. So that's that's one of the problem between us and the Saudis. That it, that's a dissonance of a disparity between uh, threat perceptions. We don't perceive them as a threat, but we are number one threat for them. When they rank their threat perception, Iran is number one. So we orient our action toward our threat perception, not from the things which we don't perceive them as a threat. We perceive Israelis and Americans as a threat. So that's why we are there. And it is not a projection of influence or power. Although there are people in Iran who would argue along those ways. That, you know, Iran basically is a powerful country and we should project our power naturally. And they borrow from the narratives of the Shah about the Cyrus the Great, so forth, the, the Achaemenite empires, or the Islamic, the Islamic period. So those who want to argue along the line of projection of power, although they are very dissimilar in the orientation, uh, the ideological orientation, but I still they, they their conclusion are almost the same. We need to project power. But that's a very minority view. Can I just jump in quickly and ask a follow up question to this idea that the US and Israel, for instance, are the top two, you mentioned, uh, threats that Iran perceives. Um, could we just tease that out a little bit? What exactly is the concern in Tehran from the US, from Israel? What does Tehran fear? Uh, or what is Ron concerned about from those two countries? What what are kind of the, the issues, the security threats that Tehran sees uh, from those two players? Both of them are constantly threatening Iran. All options are on the table. And the perception in Tehran is US policy 
to put it very mildly, which is my view, US policy has been toward Iran containment plus selective engagement. But there are people who would argue that no, the US policy is regime change. Okay. And there are plenty of evidence, uh, verbally or non verbally, that would support their argument. It's constantly they are threatening Iran. So that's why. They feel threatened and thus they try to come up with the idea to do uh, to do something. Uh, so the concern is very much around the concern is very much around regime change, is it? Or is it just concerns around military strikes, uh, but not necessarily no. regime change? All of them. But All as I said, them. but as I said, that I mean there is a strong view here that they argue, it's not my view, of course. My view is is, is as I said, is containment plus selective engagement. Uh, but their view is, no, that's outright uh, regime change, and they are acting on that basis. There are a lot of covert action uh, inside Iran, cyber activity, so forth and so on. They, they provide all sorts of evidence to say that, okay, they are for, they are for regime change. We are in a war uh, already. Thus, we have to create that effective deterrence belt around Israel. If we, have, if we, if we are able to do that, Basically, then we have created uh, a sort of a security for ourselves. So that's that's the argument. And that's a very much a defensive posture. You are right. It is a defensive posture uh, of someone who have been threatened and they want to protect themselves. Uh, so that's our argument uh, in that regard. Great, thanks. And I guess to now carry that question over to um, the concerns around Saudi Arabia and regional chaos, as you had put it. Um, could we just, again, tease that out and define that a little bit? What would be the source of that regional chaos that's particularly concerning for Iran? Um, I can venture some guesses, but I'd like to hear it uh, from you as, as the expert. But um, And then on the other hand, what exactly is the concern from Saudi Arabia? Is the concern, again, around Iranian territorial integrity around attacks on Iran, around uh, potentially um, Saudi Arabia supporting movements within Iran that are destabilizing. What is precisely the, the concern that Iran has? Uh, there are two myths, I want to say, in the West regarding the roots of the problem in the Middle East. Uh, one is uh, Shia Sunni rivalry, which is creating a lot of these problems, and also a rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which are not identical but linked to one another. Both issues uh, are linked to one another, and which to me both are wrong. And if we identify the problem wrongly, thus our prescriptions and recommendations are going to be most probably wrong as well. First of all, Iran is not competing with Saudi Arabia. As I said, that it is only five, six years that we have considered Saudis as a threat, and that's a very distant fifth threat. We never, we never thought, you know, Saudis is posing a threat to us, a major threat. Uh, so, uh, we never competed with Saudi Arabia for the influence. And we think that the enemy is US, as Israel, thus all our action should be oriented toward removing those threats. But somehow, as an unintended consequence of that action on our part, and mobilization of the resources from the other side, Israelis, Americans, and Saudis, and the others. Mobilizing the resources to portray that unintended consequences as intended consequences. Meaning that what you're doing in Syria is a threat to me in Riyadh, in Abu Dhabi. 
What you're doing in Iraq, what you're doing in Lebanon is a threat to me. We never intended that, but that's an unintended consequence of what we are doing. So Iran has a lot to offer to Saudis regarding uh, removing that perception. We have to do more, we have already done some, we have to do more. But that's not going to be enough by itself. Because Saudis have been acting against us for the last 30 some years. I never paid any cost for their action against Iran. And we were very much compromising in order to concentrate on what we perceive to be the main threat. So, but, but with Yemen, that changed. There was a conclusion in Tehran, unless Saudis feel pressure and pay some cost, they are not going to quit what they are doing against us. And what they are doing against us is not just only outside Iran. It's not in Pakistan. It's not in Afghanistan. It's inside Iran. They are paying a lot of political capital, diplomatic capital, in a lot of capitals in the world in order to pressure Iran. And they never paid any cost for their actions. But Yemen is the beginning to me, unless there is an agreement, which I'm very hopeful there is going to be soon. I would argue, I would, I would say why. So then the Saudis would stop what they are doing. Thus, our strategy is there should be a cost inside Saudi Arabia and outside Saudi Arabia. Number two, we need a lot of explanation. Number three is giving them concession on some issues which is important for them. So that's why Iran is ready to give concession to the Saudis in order to improve the relationship and neutralize their action against Iran. So, and I hope that would work. But from the strategic calculus of Saudis, when they look at the situation, is basically now that yes, they are paying some sort of a cost, but they would look at their relation with us as evolving relation between us and the US, us and the Russia, and us and China. Okay, these are important. Saudi Iranian relationship from the Saudi views is subject to our relationship with these countries, which I mentioned. That to what depth we are going to develop a relationship with China, Russia, or US, then they would basically manage their relationship with us within that lens. So these are the type of issues that are important for the strategic calculus of the Saudis. And I'm hopeful now, because of the JCPOA, this Iranian nuclear program, which is a very good probability that we are going to get there, then Saudi's relation with us is going to change at least at the open. And we hope things can get better at a deeper level as well. Because then they, are, they think that they are gonna finish the Yemeni war with our help. And we are gonna offer them some concession. And also they see our relationship with China, Russia and US, all three are different. Thus they would try to uh, manage their relationship with us in a better way. And we hope at the end of the day, we neutralize Saudi Arabia as, uh, as, a, as a country who is against us to be at least neutral, not supporting us, not be friend with us, but at least to be neutral regarding our fight with the other threat perceptions. 
Thank you very much for that. And, and we will come back to, to some of those questions of how relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia can perhaps change over the coming years. But I just wanted to, before we move on to the nuclear issue, just one final little question. What about the other Gulf monarchies, uh, whether it be the UAE, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, how do, do they feature in Iran's sort of strategic view of its neighborhood at all? Or is it really yes. about these bigger states? We, we think we have to improve our relationship with them all. Okay. You know, with Kuwait, with Qatar, and with Oman, we don't have that much problem. In other words, it's a very much a normal relationship. It's Bahrain and UAE. Okay. With UAE, we have a very much managed relationship. No matter what we say publicly, at the end of the day, I guess UAE is the, our second uh, biggest partner, commercial partner. See, there are so many flights back and forth from Tehran to Riyadh. So uh, not that much problem uh, with the UAE. Yeah, there is a problem with the UAE, but it's, it's managed. We are managing the problems. So Bahrain, to be frank with you, is just not a very diplomatic way to put it, but too little to be that significant in our in our strategic calculus. Okay, so thus uh, we think that if we have to, if we resolve the problem with the Saudis, to a large extent, we are in a right track to resolve our problem with the others. And the Bahrain is going to follow suit what the Saudis are going to do. That's really helpful. Thanks. Um, yeah, and it's always tricky, isn't it, to um, to kind of unbulk, I guess, the, the the Gulf states. We tend to talk about them a lot of the time as, you know, the GCC states, the Gulf states. But it is important to recognize the fact that they all have individual and independent policies towards their neighbors. And Iran obviously has independent relationships with each one of those states as well that that differ from um, from state to state. So we're hoping to, to tease that out today, but also over over the course of the rest of the series. Um, yeah, yeah, to add to, mm -hmm. add to what you said, in fact, you know, Oman is so much trusted in Tehran that for many important, significant, secret issues, we go to the Omanis and Omanis come to us. It means that's a very deep trust. It's a very deep trust, which has been built not just after the revolution, even in fact, even before the revolution. So that trust, I mean, that trust is there and that's a very important and significant issue. Right, right, yeah. Um, no, that's a that's a great point. Um, and I mean, the Omanis obviously also played an important role in advance of the last or I guess the negotiation of the the joint comprehensive plan of action, kind of laying the groundwork the first time around for that as well. Um, so moving on to um, the nuclear question, I guess, shifting gears a little bit, but also coming back to something you mentioned earlier, this idea that a return to the JCPOA, so the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that's the Iran nuclear deal, um, as it's sometimes known, um, that coming back to that might provide a foundation uh, for an improvement of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular, you mentioned. So I guess I was wondering if we could expand on that a little bit. How do you see, I guess to go back to the larger question of the podcast series and of the project, how do you see this interaction between uh, the developments on the Iranian nuclear program and in particular diplomacy around the Iranian nuclear program? How do you see that interacting with regional security dynamics? Um, do regional security dynamics drive Iranian approaches to nuclear diplomacy and, and activity around the program? Is Iran conscious of the fact that uh, these developments on its nuclear program and on nuclear diplomacy might impact its relationships across the region? How do those two things interact with each other? Sitting in Tehran, they are, I don't want to say totally, but almost irrelevant. The regional issue, regional security uh, to uh, our nuclear program and it, our nuclear negotiation. We think they are different. 
and uh, I guess that's the way the international community, which I don't like the word, it's so vague and mostly a journalistic or a political term uh, for politician rather than academician to use. But anyway, permit me vaguely to use that international community, or let's put it West. Also view the issue the same way. They think they are irrelevant. Of course, we can say they can help. I mean, the resolution of the problem can help the process. And if we do not resolve the issue and we go to plan B, then the regional issue will be very important. But the resolution, uh, the impact would be mostly psychological. As I mentioned, it's going to be psychological. Uh, and the pe people may think that, okay, that's a positive thing. Let's work with Iran. Let's look at the lot. Let's look at Iran from a different perspective. And others would also look at it exactly the opposite. They would say that, okay, Iran is going to have a lot of resources and are going to mobilize those resources for destabilizing the region, so forth and so on. So I'm sure you have heard all those arguments. But as I said, sitting in Tehran, we think they are, they are not related. And uh, unless we don't resolve the issue of the JCPOA, uh, then yes, the region is going to be very important because the plan B may be a war, and a war certainly is going to be a regional war. It's not going to be US-Iran war or Israeli-US-Iran war. It's going to be a regional war. Everyone is going to be involved. Then in that regard, region is important. In that regard, so that's why the Saudis, UAEs, particularly, and the Bahrainis, they are all very worried. Because before that, they didn't care about the war between Iran and the US. Not only did they care, they loved it. But there is a war. But now they feel that, okay, if there is a war, they're going to be involved. And what happened last year in Aramco, and in UAE, they, they saw that, yes, they are in a front line. It's not going to be a war between Iran and the US. It's going to be a regional war. So that's why they have an uh, ambivalent uh, feeling regarding the war. On the one side, they'd love to see Iran's power to be reduced by American or Israelis. But from the other side, they think that they may be involved and who knows what would happen. Professor, just to, just to clarify, are you saying that the uh, what you're referring to is, is presumably the attack on the Saudi oil facilities in um, in Upkick no, in greater, September? Far greater. far greater. It's going to be land invasion as well. Yeah, it's not you, going to be drone missiles, so forth and so on. But it's you're referring to, to you're referring to the attack back in in September 2019 when uh, the Saudi oil facility came under attack from drones and yes. missiles. So are you saying that that was an, a deliberate sort of message from Iran to show Saudi Arabia and its neighbors that if indeed there were a war, they would be part of it? Was do you think that was active signaling? And, from uh, yeah. And the Americans too. It was right. mostly signal to America more than anyone else. And that's why the Saudis concluded they cannot rely totally on America. American didn't do anything. President Trump said, you know, they didn't kill us. They didn't attack us. OK, so that was an important signal. So the strategic calculus now is different. So if the calculus is different, it doesn't mean automatically that's a change of behavior. Only the calculus is different. But we hope that calculus will, will reflect on the behavior. OK. Of course, sorry to be so blunt. Uh, I'm not a government official, so that's, that's I can be far more explicit in what I say. Uh, OK, regarding all these issues. So that's why uh, uh, I feel uh, that the war with Iran now is not as simple as it was perceived before among the regional uh, players. 
is far more complicated. Understood, and of course we we very much appreciate your bluntness. Um, I wonder whether we could, for a moment though, take a little bit of a step back and just have a brief look at the nuclear question itself. Um, if the nuclear program is indeed not about regional security uh, and not about Iran's position within the region, then what is it about? Why is Iran looking to develop its nuclear program? Uh, what are the key objectives here? Is it really just as Iran always says it is about uh, developing a peaceful civilian use of energy and other technologies? Or is there something else to it? In fact, I have written an article about it 10 years ago. And uh, basically, I was the first individual who discussed about neither of those options. And I, I, I basically articulated a position called capability. And I, I presented that for the first time uh, when I was invited to a Senate Foreign Relations Committee in US and as a Iranian expert there. That's where I said that not what Iran says, which is we are for a peaceful, you know, energy, medicine, so forth and so on. And not what you say that Iran is looking for a bomb. Those are the two positions which is not acceptable to me. I said what Iran is looking for is the capability. And 10 years ago, that's about 18 years ago, 10 years ago, I further refined the concept. And I said that what capability means. Capability has three important components. Mastering the knowledge and technology of entire fuel cycle, which is seven parts. Number two, a reliable delivery system. In our case, Mr. Number three is study, only a study. Study of warhead, warhead design, how to put these materials into a warhead, which is which can deliver to a target. That warhead. So the first two are very much legal. That's what I call it lawful capability. But the third one, but the dominant reading of international documents is not legal. That's what I call it full capability. I have argued Iran has been looking for the full capability before, before 2003. But afterward, it settled with the lawful capability. So that's why we want this capability. Then I have listed five Iranian foreign policy objectives. And I've come up with a chart with four with, with, with conceptual, conceptual distinction of four important uh, phenomena like energy, peaceful energy, so forth and so on, and then lawful capability, full capability, and the bomb. And then I have listed five foreign policy objectives. I've said which one would serve us better. I've, con I've concluded myself and defended that position that the lawful capability. Rather than the full capability or, uh, or, or the bomb. OK. Because I have said, yes, deterrence is one important foreign policy objective among the five. But there are other important subject to like a development. With the bomb of full capability, we don't have a same uh, same uh, chances to develop ourselves, to go through development, comparing with the full capability or comparing with the bomb. So lawful capability would serve us better in terms of the development. So at the end of that chart, I would say we are better off with the lawful capability. And, and that to some extent that would serve our security interest as well. Because that's not enough. 
to incentivize the others to go for the bomb. Because if you have the bomb, which I've argued against, I've provided 14 reasons why, why bomb not only would not enhance our security, but rather it's going to increase our vulnerabilities. I provided 14 reasons for that. So that's why I think we are better off with the lawful capability. And I provided other reasons for it. Okay, go ahead. So yeah, if I can just clarify then, I guess on that point, um, is the concern then that if Iran pushes too hard, uh, if this question around Iranian intention seems to become clearer and clearer that the intention is to develop a nuclear weapons capability, is the concern then that that pushes others in the region to develop nuclear weapons? Is the concern over direct attack on Iranian facilities, regime change, et cetera? What is the concern of the consequences if, again, that that sort of perhaps confusion or blurred line in intentions so that that becomes less and less blurred and becomes clear and clear that Iran's pushing, for instance, for a nuclear weapon. So Iran is not pushing. As I said that, or in our strategic calculus, I provided 14 reasons that that would not enhance our security. One of them is exactly because of you said that would generate an arm race in the region. Okay, this is just one. I provided 14 reasons. Why? that would not enhance our security. So that's why we are not looking for, we are not looking for the weapons. I think we have never looked for the weapons. We have entertained the option of full capability. Okay, we have the full capability, yes, we have entertained that. But after 2003, we have stopped even that. So we are not going to go for the full capability, which has the third element of that component uh, to what I said before. So that's why that's where we are now. And that's where the J JCPOA is. Basically, JCPOA means lawful capability. OK, I see. I see how you're drawing the distinction there. Um, I guess, what what is Iran trying to achieve then? with this as you call it lawful capability what is the what are what are the foreign policy objectives you said you've laid out uh, a list of 14 i haven't read the the piece but could you kind of walk us through the objectives that iran is trying to achieve with this so that 14 are the reasons against the weaponization yes sorry you had four foreign policy objectives is that correct yeah five, five. yes okay okay i've compared each one of those four with that five Foreign policy objective. For instance, lawful capability may create us less deterrence than the bomb or than the full capability, but it can give us a chance for development far better than the others. Okay. Uh, so, regarding our relationship with the international community, we are better off with the lawful capability and with the other two. So that's why I don't remember exactly what 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 were the five. That's ten years ago, which I wrote the article. Okay. Uh, so, but I, I remember the conclusion, which was we are better off with the lawful capability. That's before the JCPOA. That's two years before the JCPOA. Okay. Uh, so that's why I think uh, uh, still today, that's predominantly. Predominantly, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about everyone. That's the important uh, uh, consensus point for many policymakers that we have to go for the lawful capability, which is JCPOA. There are people who have been arguing against the JCPOA. They have been arguing against the lawful. They want to go all the way to the bomb. There are people who would love to go to the full capability, but they are a minority, very minority. I can say even there is a consensus or absolute majority for the lawful capability. So do you see 
diplomacy around the nuclear program as an objective in and of itself, that engagement with the West, the US, China, Russia, et cetera. Um, do you see that as an objective in and of itself, kind of despite what comes out the other end for, for Iran? Depends on whom you ask. You know, uh, I was critical of the JCPOA myself, but the specific specifics of it, and criticize it very in a detailed way. But I supported it. And in fact, the hardliners here in Tehran, I had a talk in Atlantic Council basically in Washington. That was the time which we approved the JCPOA, but not yet uh, gone to the implementation and to the Congress yet. I had a talk in Atlantic Council. There I would say that if I were there, if I were Zarif, I would have not signed the thing. Because that's not reciprocal. We have given a lot and just only got back promises. And unfortunately, that's what happened. But I said that I would support the deal. So that's why the hardliners in Tehran basically put that phrase that I would have not signed it as a front page. But Hadian, as a reformers, would say that I would have not signed it, this JCPOA. But they did not, but they eliminated the next phrase, which I said that I support the deal. So that's the same thing basically now. To me, the JCPOA has achieved five important objectives. It has, first of all, dismantled the consensus against international consensus against us. That came, that's, that's not in the JCPOA. There's no phrase in that regard. <laughs> But that was the consequence of the JCPOA. Number two is it, it desecuritize our file. Desecuritizing because under President Ahmadinejad, West was successful in securitizing a folder and the UN Security Council resolutions, six of them, was an indicator, was an indication of that successful securitization. So JCPOA successfully desecuritized our file. Third, it normalized our relationship with the West, with the, I don't like the phrase, international community. It normalized our relationship. Normalized has two meaning. Normalization means, you know, exchanges of foreign ministers, presidents, directors, or so forth and so on. If you remember, uh, under President Ahmadinejad, even the deputy minister could not travel to the West. That's one meaning. And the second meaning of normalization was, West was successful in portraying Iran as, as an abnormal state and people. People are chanting the street, death to America, so forth and so on all those images. So it normalized our image. Zarif talking to the people, to the international community, they found him very interesting guy, very articulated individual, speaking very good language. Uh, so it normalized uh, our image. So with two different meanings of normalization, we had normalization as a result of the JCPOA. Number four is, it strengthened our hand or freeing our hands to spend more time in the region. I'm not talking about the resources which come as a, as a result of the fifth, but basically freeing our hand. Three fourths of our foreign ministry was spending time basically in dealing with the JCPOA. A lot of the energy of the country was being spent on, on the JCPOA. So we had a freer hand to spend uh, time and energy basically in, 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 in our region. And the number fifth was removal of sanctions. Only removal of sanctions was inside the JCPOA. The other four which I mentioned was not a part of the JCPOA, but came about as a consequences of the JCPOA. So sanctions also were very important. 
is important domestically and internationally, particularly domestically. So these are the benefits of the JCPOA. But I have provided six reasons, which I'm not going to go with, don't worry about it. Six reasons why Iran and US both agreed with the JCPOA. Okay. So three of those six still are present. That's why I think we are going to go to the JCPOA. We are going to go back to the JCPOA. Because it's so, the plan B's are so bad. Are so bad that not out of rationality or rational thinking or love or being a peaceful individual, not out of those things we are going to go back to the JCPOA, but out of necessity. Because we don't have any other way. The other way is so bad. It's so horrible. That all of them would think that it's better to, it's better to go back to the JCPOA. And let's, I would like to add a phrase here, and that's a very key phrase. Let's, let's not create artificial deadline for ourselves. Let's not create ultimatums. I'm talking from our side here. It's not going to help. It's going to get things worse here. This constant threat of, of our other options are open. OK, keep it for yourself. Once the time comes, use the other options. But once you say it, it's being perceived here as, first of all, bluff. And second, that would only strengthen the, heart of the hands of the hardliners. So why you are why you are uttering out those st statements? Because it doesn't have an impact on a strategic accuracy. If you want to send a message, send it privately through important channels, convey your consents. But these public statements only worsen the thing, worsen, worsening the situation here domestically. But also these artificial deadlines that February, March, whatever, if you don't have a JCPO, then we are going to go to the, op the, other, to the other option. You know that the other options are terrible and you're not going to go there. So we don't have any other way. What would happen, for instance, in three months? Let's assume Iran has rather than 120 kilograms of 60% uh, ura and rich uranium, they have 200 kilograms. Let's have uh, another 10,000 kilograms of whatever uranium uh, at 3.67. Let's imagine we have more centrifuge in, in stock. What would happen? We already have the knowledge, we, have, we already have the technology. Yes, we, are, we may be able to get a little bit more knowledge, but I still, you know that we are talk, these are all artificial deadlines. You know that at the end of the day, you are talking about only the necessity materials. There is a huge distance from having more than 10 times kilograms of a nuclear bomb, okay? What about 250 kilograms or 300 kilograms of 98% enriched uranium? Let's assume Iran has it. But from that point to the bomb, to a reliable delivery system, according to the Israelis themselves, it will take from two to five years, or the Americans one to two years. So then why, why we are creating such a kind of a, such a kind of a artificial deadlines for ourselves? Let's concentrate on the deal. Let's come up with the incentives. Let's try to concentrate on the concerns of Iranian as well. Let's agree, which I guess they agree, that it was President Trump problem. It was President Trump man-made problem. By withdrawing due to domestic politics of America from the JCPOA. So there should be a cost associated with what happened. We suffered more than $250 billion as a result of this action. And that's a lot of money for a country like Iran. We are not, now we are not asking for, as a precondition for going back to the JCPOA about those damages. But we have other concerns, which are legitimate concerns. Because just last night, Senator Ted Cruz said, the minute we get the majority Republican, 
in the Senate, which there is a good chance that they would get, they're going to tear down the JCPOA. You should give us the right that we should be worried about. We should be worried about uh, the future of the JCPOA. Right now, by far the most important issues are not the type of sanction or the uh, number of sanctions which are going to be removed. Number one issue for Iran now is sustainability of the deal. We want to make sure that the deal is going to remain there if they if they get the Senate, if they get the House, if they if they get the presidency next time, which there's a good chance. Senator Rubio, uh, Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State, President Trump, former President Trump, they all have said, when we come to power, we are going to do the same thing. You have to give us a right to be born. Come up with a plan. With a plan to make the deal sustainable. That's by far number one issue for Iran. Number right. two is, oh. let me say the number two and then finish. Number <laughs> two is verification. We would like to be sure this time, because we trusted once. On both, on both of these issues, we trusted once the international community, the Americans, that okay, we trust you. But we, we see what happened. This time, we just want to be sure we get the benefits that we are supposed to get. That means verification. And these are both very legitimate concerns across the political spectrum in Tehran. I'm talking as a reformers. And that's my concern as well. So we need to have guarantee, whatever you want to call it, sustainability of the deal. And we have to have a verification. We want to be sure we are going to get the benefits we are supposed to get. So these are the two important issues. If you can come up with a plan, Iran is very much open on that one. Come up I mean, with I don't think, I don't think I'll come up with a plan. I don't think Tobias and I will, <laughs> but um, I mean, I I'm think there are legitimate. About the West, I'm ta I was talking basically about the West. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think I think there are legitimate concerns. I think there has to be a recognition. There's some challenges when it comes to all those things from the U.S. side as well uh, in terms of providing guarantees, verification. But uh, to avoid going down that rabbit hole, um, there's a lot to unpack there, I think. Uh, but perhaps let's maybe park that one, unfortunately, <laughs> for now. Um, and Tobias, I know I think you had a question, didn't you, that you wanted to throw in? Yes, absolutely, Professor. And I. I wonder whether I, I find your sort of laying out of Iran's objectives with its nuclear program really interesting. What you describe as legal capability of both developing the the expertise and technology for the full fuel cycle and developing the capability of having a delivery system. But as you say, not going to the next step, i.e. actually building a nuclear weapon putting that on a missile in order to being able it's to, deliver, not a, deliver, to no, deliver. That's a question. Making it happen is an entirely different issue. Even studying it. Even okay. so even studying is off the table. But can you see how countries in the region, neighbors of Iran, and I guess also countries across Europe and uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, would be concerned that that requires them to purely trust Iran because Iran now builds all the capability but then essentially says but we're going to stop here and we're not going to take another step so clearly all of this is about asking everyone else to trust Iran that that is indeed where Iran will stop and the JCPOA will just keep it's just Iran. So the JCPOA is Iran's commitment to stop there. We, in fact, uh, to bias, we have we have already had that discussion before the JCPOA. You know, we, for a while we had a discussion of intention and capability. In other words, the Americans were arguing in order to be sure about the about the intention, it's better not to have them not to have the capability. Okay, but they they concluded that's impossible. We are already past that stage. 
they already passed that stage. That's no longer an issue. That's why we had the JCPOA. Otherwise, they would have not agreed with the JCPOA. So JCPOA basically means acceptance, recognition of Iran's having Iran having a, Iran having a capability, legal capability. That's basically J JCPOA means. Because if you want to remove the capability in order to be satisfied, and in order to be not caring about the, JC, the, the intentions, uh, we are we already have passed that stage. No longer that's that that's an issue, and uh, so that's why we have the JCPOA, and that's better to concentrate on that. But we, we have to think now that how we can give confidence to the others that okay, it's not going to be used. It's we are not we are not going to go further uh, than what we are we are going to uh, accept. We are going to accept legally. We are not going to go for instance for the study of those things. And that's basically Iran ratifying the additional protocol. Which is going to come, I guess, at the year eight or ten of the JCPOA. So those are the things, those are instruments which can help to build confidence. A very strong monitoring inspect monitoring uh, system, inspecting regime that help to give confidence to the international community that, okay, Iran is uh, abiding by its commitment under the additional protocol and the safeguard agreements. So these are the type of things which we have to come up. A regional, you know, we have a regional setting. We are supposed to have the Middle East free of WMD, and it is only Israelis who are not a part of it. Who, want, who would not support it. An American, as a result of their alliance with the US, with the Israelis, are not committing themselves, are not pushing for this, are not pushing Israelis to come to this regional setting. In that regional setting, not only we can get rid of uh, the weapons, those who actually have the weapons, like Israel, but also we can come up with a regional mechanism to have a strict inspection regime, a monitoring system that is not enshrined even in additional protocol. But those are supposed to come and those will come only in within the regional system. You can in incorporate and include that in a regional security structure if you want. And I'd love to talk more about the confidence building uh, question in just a minute. But first, I just wanted to um, sort of ask for a clarification. From my perspective, if I imagine myself sitting in in Riyadh or or elsewhere across the Middle East, on the one hand, hearing you say that uh, Iran wants to build all the capability, uh, but not make the next step for all the reasons that you just outlined. But on the other hand, you also outlined how Iran is um, has used things like the drone attacks and missile attacks on Upkick, is using things like its influence in Yemen and partnership with the with the Houthis there uh, in order to put pressure on Saudi Arabia, in order to demonstrate to Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states that there are costs involved with uh, opposing Iran, like you outline. So that to me strikes me as on the one hand, Iran yes, not opposing threatening. Iran, not acting against Iran. Acting against Iran, absolutely. But that strikes me as a combination of, on the one hand, we're going to threaten you, and on the other hand, we're going to ask you to trust us that we're not going to go to uh, build a nuclear weapon. Can you see how, from outside Iran, that seems like a really difficult balance to strike? No, I guess, uh, as I said, you know, because there is a strongest inspecting regime in place in Tehran. And to be frank with you, I doubt it is a very important issue, no matter what they say publicly, for these countries. This is mostly an issue for the Israelis, because Israelis want to be sure that they are the only one who have nuclear weapons, and the others, in fact, should not have, not only have the weapons, they shouldn't have the 
full capability, they should not have, in fact, even the legal capability. So that's why Israelis are mobilizing a lot of resources internationally and also using uh, regional players as well to confront Iran. It's not an issue for many of these countries because they know that inter international community is far more concerned than them. Okay, they're far more concerned. Israel is very much concerned, Americans then are concerned, and if I give China and Russia. Russia, to be frank with you, is far more concerned than the others. Regarding the weapons, not the capability. Because if we have the weapons, Russia is going to be far more threatened than the US. This is far away from us. Thus the Russians, the Chinese, no one wants Iran to have the weapons. And they know that they will apply enough pressure on Iran anytime in the future if we want to go, in fact, not only to the weapons, but if I give to the full capability. So I'm sure there are people in their countries that they understand those issues. I have to talk, I have talked to some of them. They know that that's not the case, but that's a good pressuring point. That's a, somehow a good uh, way of getting our attention. Okay. But in general, as I said, that's not an issue for them. And we are talking about, and it, and also, it doesn't make any difference if we have the, I mean, if we don't have those, those things, still we may do the, we may do the same thing. And to be frank with you, but a full capability, we feel less obliged to act against the regional player. If we don't have that capability, the chances of acting is more, exactly like now. Okay, okay right now, we don't have none of them, but we acted. Okay, then let's, let's talk briefly about confidence building then. Um, you, on the one hand, of course, described the JCPOA itself as a bit of a, as a basis for trust building. So a new agreement uh, that brings verification back on both sides uh, would be a basis for trust building. But focusing on trust building, particularly between Iran and its neighbors in the Gulf, what do you see any other areas in which trust can be built? What can be the basis for trust building? I know that at the moment there's lots of lots of talking going on, right, between Abu Dhabi and Tehran, between Riyadh and Tehran even. Um, and of course, uh, Oman, Qatar and Kuwait have more regular exchanges with Iran already. But do you see any practical areas in which Iran and its neighbors in the Gulf can build trust, can build cooperation even? Yes, uh, in fact, I'm very much optimist, to be frank with you in that regard. <laughs> Uh, because I think that the out of necessity, we are going to have a JCPOA. Once we have the JCPOA, we are going to establish our diplomatic ties with the Saudis. And then uh, it is in our program, I guess, that we invite these people when we are going to fire a missiles. First, we are going to begin with the friends. We're going to invite them to the sites. We are going to give them accesses to our nuclear program, which we don't give it to the others. And these are going to be confidence building measure. Does building would go would go far away in order to attract their trust, provided that this is reciprocal. Does building maybe, diplomatic relationships with Riyadh require Iran to end its support for the Houthis in Yemen, for example? Yeah, people, as I said, that within that, it's very much uh, conceivable we give concession. As I mentioned, of course, it doesn't mean that we, we will dismiss uh, the concerns of the Houthis, but we're going to help uh, to bring an end to the war. We will help that Saudis have a good relation with the, with the Houthis and with the Yemenis. Okay, as I said, that Iran is ready to give concession as a bigger country uh, to the Saudis. But it all depends. It all depends that uh, we have it. We go through uh, diplomatic ties with the, with the Saudis and the Saudis stop basically uh, intervening 
or acting against us. Which is uh, which I'm um, hopefully it would, it would come because that would serve our interests together. So that's why I'm hopeful. Can I follow up on that quickly um, and perhaps move us to relationships between Iran and other um, countries outside of the region? Uh, Tobias and I are both sitting in London, um, so we'd be remiss if we didn't ask this question. Um, and I think maybe it's one that we'll ask of all of our experts that come on as kind of a final exam question. Um, what role do you think Iran sees for the UK in particular, um, perhaps the EU as well, but for the UK um, in regional security dynamics and supporting trust building measures in supporting uh, a move towards, as you called it, normalization of ties between uh, Iran and its neighbors um, and in addressing other regional security issues. Do you see a role for the UK to play at all? Um, what capabilities, what assets do you think the UK can bring to the region? I don't mean that, and I mean that kind of in, in a loose sense, diplomatic diplomatic assets, diplomatic expertise, uh, experience, relationships potentially, um, or anything else if you think it would be of relevance. First of all, you can pray. <laughs> That's the easiest <laughs> way. <laughs> Thanks, have, we'll, uh, we'll take oh. note. <laughs> but two, um, I guess uh, there is a negative perception of the United Kingdom, British basically, in Iran. So anything would be received and perceived suspiciously. So either not involvement, at least from our side, I'm not sure about the other side, the other side may welcome that, but if they want to be involved, they should play an objective role. They should be very much unbiased in their approach if they want to be helpful, which is very difficult. Because your interest to a large extent, I'm talking about that when I say your, I, I don't mean you. I'm talking about Brit I'm talking about British government. Uh, British government interest is to have a good relationship. Uh, because with, with a lot of the Persian Gulf uh, Arab states, they have a deep infrastructure of influence there. Thus, it is only natural for them to support their interest. And that would be not wise of asking a country not basically acting on the basis of its national interest. Uh, but they rule, as I said, I, I, I don't I don't know if I say thanks God uh, or not. Uh, that they rule the power is very limited in the region, and it is to a large extent the United States, not in fact even Russia or France or Britain. Can I throw China into that mix? China is the different case now, or at least in five next five ten years. China, China's interest in the region is very different because so far Chinese have been free rider. They have used or they have purchased or they have whatever you call it of the security which Americans have provided for more than 50 years, 60 years. But no longer that free ride is available. America is making it harder and harder and harder. That China should come itself, provide the security of the energy resources. So that's why China's relationship with Iran, because we used to look at China basically as a factory and Chinese look at Iran as a market. But that is being changed. China is looking more strategically toward Iran. China think that, you know, there is going to be a coalition of Americans, mostly Australians, South Koreans, Japanese and Indians, and American as a balancer to balance Chinese power within the East Asia. China's potential allies are then Russia, Iran, Pakistan. And it's going to impact our relationship with one another too. 
Uh, so China knows that Iran has a Iran is a very powerful country. Particularly, it can have a destructive power, can destabilize the region. Does China's economic presence in Iran is going to be translated in political influence? They try then to persuade, convince, force Iran to have a different approach in the region. China has the same relationship, a very important economic relationship with all the Persian Gulf Arab states. Thus, China is going to be a play, is going to play a very crucial role. All of us are going to compete to have Beijing's attention. China is going to be far more engaged and involved in the region because of its energy needs. And, and China knows that, cannot rely on America any longer. So that's why China's relationship is different from UK, France, Russia. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, there is so much more that we could dig into. I think we could spend all day talking to you, uh, but we've taken more of your time than we should have already. Um, so just from Tobias, from myself, a huge thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It really has been a pleasure and um, for me at least, a really valuable discussion.